welcome to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software. And that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. All right, welcome back to the Built on Air podcast after a month break, month and a week. We're off an extra week, so thanks for being patient with us. Good to be back with you. We are now into season 14, starting episode one. Welcome back, Ali. Good to see you again. Thank you. Glad to be back. Good to see you too. Yeah, lots going on in the uh, Airtable world. Uh, Camille couldn't make it today, but we are excited for this new season. I was thinking about what um, what we're going to be doing this season. A couple things. Um, this will be uh, Dare Table. Will be during this season, so. We'll maybe do a live show from Dare Table if we can. I, th- I think I promised that last year and we didn't do it. So this year I'll try to try to fulfill that promise. Do a live show, meet lots of lots of you. Hopefully we'll be out there and uh, hopefully we'll meet some some new people. And uh, we'd love to have you on the show as well. So um, other stuff, I think we're gonna plan. There's a lot going on. Actually today we'll be talking about some some chat GPT stuff. I think we're going to have a, an episode focused entirely on chat GPT and Airtable. So that'll be exciting. Um, we'll announce probably a new sponsor this season. We're in the works with a, with a new sponsor and uh, not quite ready to announce that yet, but I think this season we'll be bringing on a new sponsor. So that'll be good. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting stuff going on in, in the built on air world. And always good to be back with you. Hopefully everybody enjoyed your uh, your month break from us, caught up on all our old episodes and ready to begin a new season. So let me walk through what we're going to be doing today. <clears throat> we always start off with our round the bases, getting you caught up on what's new in the Airtable communities. Then we'll spotlight onto our primary sponsor. Then Ali's going to go through... Um, how to use formulas to drive your single select fields. Um, And then I'm going to be talking about API keys and understanding all the difference between API tokens and keys and very confusing stuff going on, help you decipher the changes that are, that have happened there. Then a quick shout out to our community. Then we'll end with a, with an app highlight, an extension task Robin that's, that's in the marketplace. So we'll, We'll check that out to end it. All right, let's see. So we've been off a month, so lots of new stuff going on. Um, let, let's start with the features. So um, Airtable released quite a few features since we last met. Probably some of the bigger ones came from the, the new interface design features that launched March 1st. Um, so right, right after we uh, ended, and um, so yeah, new page layouts. What else we got? Um, side sheet. That's a cool one. Reusable record detail. Um, default values in interfaces. They also, I don't know if I have it here. They also added default values to single single selects. 
No. Uh, is it in multi-select, the default multi-select? I so rarely use multi-select fields, I don't even know. Let me see quickly. Yeah, we'll check that. I, it does not look like it. Okay, just single select. So yeah, yeah so default values, but, but in interface forms, you can get those. Um, let's see. Quicker access to uh, schema changes. I don't gotta see what else. Templates, yeah. So yeah, they did announce. I don't know if I have it here, but they um, they you can now edit your fields directly in interfaces, so you can make changes to the the field configuration, so you don't That's have to jump back to the data. Thoughts yeah. on any of these changes? What's your favorite? Uh, my favorite's probably the side sheet option for the record detail layouts. I'm finding that really, really nice and handy. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just looks really, like, really sleek and clean. Um, I am. I wish I were a bigger fan of the new page layouts. <laughs> I, I was just saying to Dan before we went live here, it bothers me how inconsistent it is across the different layouts because if you start off with a list view layout or a gallery view. I love that you can you can let the user filter or change, like filter, sort, and then they can even change what the layout is that they're looking at. Really, really cool stuff that I wish were available when you drag a list layout or a, a list element rather into a different layout, um, which is not available right now. And you can't actually even drag any other element elements onto the page if you go with one of these new layouts, which is annoying as well. Yeah. Yeah, so enough to get you excited, <laughs> um, but maybe not get you all the way there that you would hope to. So hopefully there's there's still iterations coming. Hopefully. I would, I would think that they're going to make it consistent across the board. It seems kind of halfway done at this point. Um, I also love the ability to add a new record right from that screen, which is nice. That's good right there. Yeah. 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 And the, um, yeah, I can't remember when everything came out, but like the ability to ha add these like tab filters, I can't remember if that's part of this upgrade or if that was previous. I think it was part of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. I know we use that quite a bit. So that's really nice. I think we talked about that before, so that that might have came up previous. Um, yeah, the slide sh side sheet. I don't I don't know if I have one handy to show, um, but basically, yeah, you can click on a record and it comes from the right side, and so you can see the the record details instead of like a pop up modal. So that's pretty slick. Um, so yeah, cool stuff there. I think there's more. Let's see. Um, this was one, I believe somebody posted this um, from the Built on Air Slack community, um, talking about different uh, interface designer permission dependencies. Uh, I thought this was, was worth um, pointing out. Um, so you can, um, see, I gotta refresh my memory on this one. Um, yeah, I haven't noticed any differences amongst dependencies and sharing things. Mm. Feels like we're just yeah. gonna move the options around, like where you can access them. But gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It might have been. Um, I think. I think what happened now that I remember. I think somebody pointed this out and was asking if this was new. But then I think there might have been feedback that that it hasn't changed. And so it's just new to the person that pointed it out. So there may not be anything here. Um, I really, I can't wait for the day where we have conditional visibility entirely on interfaces. Yeah, right. Yeah, the whole, there is like, if you're using a, a collaborator field or user field, um, but you have to do that for everybody. So that's where it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you can make it a different type of conditional mm -hmm. is, is needed. So um, yeah, that, that might have been what it was talking about as well. Um, but you can do more permissions in your interfaces than you can at the at the data grid level. 
Right. Um, so it definitely is a, a step in the right direction. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Here's another one that they, uh, it's been in beta for a while. So I had seen it previously, but, but now it's live record templates. Have you played with record templates? I did when it was in the beta and I never really found a use case for it. Um, I suppose like maybe it could be nice from an interface if you're like, you have a, a form to open up, you know, create new project and it sets the status to new automatically or something. But at least when it was in beta and I have to say, I haven't played with it since they released it widely, but there was no way to dynamically set anything. So it just didn't really feel useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, um, yeah, you have to define. So basically the use case is you have like a project and maybe the project has a project type and depending on the project type you have different tasks associated with that and so this is very common we do this quite a bit with project management um, bases and so this allows you to when a new project is created you can set up an automation to um to basically create new tasks based on that um that template type. Um, and so you create these record templates, so you can have a template for each type of project and then associate them. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice for a very basic use case. Um, I don't know that like we would probably still do this the way that we've always done it, which is maybe with a little bit of scripting um, to, to, you know, really make it dynamic. Um, but this does help for, for your very standard, simple use case, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that I'm just, I just opened it up to play with it quickly. So yeah, you can add more than one record as part of the template. So that is nice. Yeah. And they did allow, now they do have relative date settings, which is interesting, but I don't really know that that's helpful. It doesn't doesn't quite look like it is. Yeah. It doesn't do what I would think it does. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do, we should, we should plan on doing a, a segment on going deep into record templates because it's worth, it's worth learning it and adding to your, to your toolbox. Um, but yeah, let us know in the comments. If you're, if you're watching, let us know how you're using record templates, what you think of them. Um, yeah. I could see this being flushed out more. There's more you could do here. Exactly. Right. Like I'd love to be able to, you know, fill in, make it dynamic. And like, for example, if there's a collaborator field, you know, make sure that that's filled out with the person that created the record, like have it assigned to that person or, yeah, and like make it do always a week from today or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's options I wish were there that I don't believe currently are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Very good. Um, so yeah, that's a new one that got that got added. Um, I think that's all the feature new items that came out this last month. It all just kind of blends together. I know, right? I mean, the other thing I can think of that I am so not a big fan of and doesn't seem to, either it's not released 100% yet and they're rolling it out or it's only, I haven't quite figured out when I, when it appears and when it doesn't, but there's the new apply button on the filters for particular views, which I really You're not a fan of. Really <laughs> don't like. Uh, <laughs> it's really slowing me down, and I've noticed it's. I think it's usually on views that have or tables that have a lot of records. Um, I don't know how many records that has to be for it to show up, but it's really slowing me down. And I've had a lot of people say like, "Oh, well." It's good if the view is being watched by Zapier and it prevents you from like accidentally, you know, flooding the view with all these records when you don't realize it, but they don't actually show you, like say you're changing the filters, they don't show you the preview of what it's gonna look like when you hit apply. So you don't even know what the changes are that you're making right. until you click the button. Yeah. So it's, I could go on forever about that, but not a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And is it so I can't remember. So it's only so if you don't have many records, then it doesn't show. But then it does show when you have a lot of records. I believe so. I think that that's the pattern I've noticed. Um, wow. But I don't know yeah. how many records is the threshold for it to show up. Yeah, that makes it even more confusing. You're like, yeah. wait, where did it go? Or why is that there now? I know it's so confusing. And like when I because like I'm used to just clicking away from the filter. And if the button is there. Now a little pop-up comes up and says, wait, you didn't apply your changes, but then the options in the pop-up are just back or discard. It doesn't let you click apply in the pop-up either. So it just slows me down even further because I've got to say back and then click apply. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. <clears throat> Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Scott agrees. <clears throat> Very tedious and unnecessary. Yeah, oh uh, man, add it to the list. Okay, <laughs> well, let's move on. I think we've got some cool things to show here. Um, so this is one, um, so Ben Bailey just noticed this. I think this has been here for a while, but I was like, hey, this is kind of cool. I don't know that we ever highlighted this. Uh, it was new to Ben, so it might be new to others. Um, but this is in an interface button, so there's, different types of buttons. Um, so this is a button inside of an interface that's different than a button outside <laughs> the interface. Um, and then I think even within interface, there's two different types of buttons. Um, but uh, anyway, so this is kind of a, a cool little way where um, go to URL and record. So it basically allows you to pick a field that, that uh, has a URL in it. Um, so that is very useful. So if you want to go to some external, uh, so they have go to external URL where you, where you define it right there, but this is kind of just a way to reference a field. Dynamically um, it. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Carlston, I guess it was new to him as well. So, um, worth highlighting a little trick there. Let's see what else we got. Oh, this was one. I was hoping that that uh, Camille was here to to take credit for this one. Uh, this was actually really cool. A lot of people didn't know about this one. So and it took me a while to figure out what she was talking about. So are you familiar with, with this? You want to explain it? Yeah, I use this often, actually. It's okay. really, really nice. Um, so in this... It comes with some caveats. So you, you need to make sure that you have no duplicate record names in a table, which is best practice. Um, but say you are syncing a table. When you sync a table or a view into another base, you then can change the field type of any of those synced fields that are in the synced view or table into the synced base. Um, and so if you've got, say, two tables from the same source um, into the other base and you want to make sure that they stay linked together and you can know for sure that they're not, that you have no duplicate names and everything's going to line up properly, you can just change the field type to a linked record and link it to that table. And the changes will flow through and you don't have to use an automation to keep that linked record field in sync. Um, which is really, really nice. Yeah. Cause yeah, by default, when you, when you create a sync table, all of the fields in the destination are, I, they're long text now, right? I think they're all like long text. I don't think they used to all be long text. I think somewhere they changed that, but you can still go into the destination base and then change the fields, um, to be specific. And so, um, yeah, so if you just change the field, so you just do it once, and then after that, every time it syncs over, as long as the name match, it will it will link it. And if the name doesn't match, it will actually, I think it'll create a new record in the link table, uh, a new, you know, so you might have some orphaned records in the link table if your names don't match. <clears throat> right. I typically like to use the, the record ID to make sure that things sync up just because you don't, and this doesn't re require an automation. Um, but I have noticed, like, say you sync out a table to a different base 
and you're doing stuff in that other base and you want to sync that back into your source base as a second table, you can use the record ID to link it back up to the original record as well in the same method. That's really confusing to say out loud. Yeah. I could demo it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is a really, really great tool that I've been using more and more often. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the other workaround. Now this is, now does it work if, let's say you're syncing two tables over that are linked? Yep. It will also work if if you do that, if both tables on the destination are, are synced tables. Exactly. That's Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. As long as you don't have like duplicate record names, because then you can't right. be you can't be sure that it's going to pick the right. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So you must have unique uh, primary keys. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, so it works both ways. Yeah. So even if both tables are synced, or if your destination just yeah. wants to have an independent table, right? Um, it, that it works as well in that case. So. It, it saves, yeah. Usually, like I've done it where you just set up an automation to like copy it and, and to, to create the link. Um, right, right. But this this saves that automation. What I have noticed, which is kind of interesting, is if you do use this method, and then you know how normally when you right click on a linked record field, it gives you the add lookup field option. Mm -hmm. In this case, when you when you change the field type to a linked record type, it does not give you that option. When you right click, it doesn't show you the add lookup fields, but mm. you can still, if you go create a new field, make it a type of lookup, you can still choose that as your linked field. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if this was confusing, uh, <laughs> we'll have Neil do a segment on it and, and showcase uh, this, this in a future episode. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. Let's go to the popular table forums. If you haven't joined table forums, definitely check it out. It's it's growing and, and lots of uh, interaction happening there. Um, looks like we just lost Allie. Hopefully she comes back. So this time it's not my it's not my uh, computer internet. So it looks like Allie's having internet issues. Um, there she is. Somehow my browser just like hit the back button. I don't know. <laughs> <My apologies. laughs> uh, no worries. No worries. You're back. All right. So yeah. So just kind of giving a shout out to uh, Table Forums and Scott and uh, Kavan and everybody that's that's active over there. Um, appreciate it. Lots of lots of cool conversations. So I was going to showcase a couple show and tells um, from there. This is a really good tutorial from Kavan on how to convert a script from scripting extension to an automation script. There are differences. There are um, things you can do in one and not in the other. Um, I know I get this quite a bit. I need to, I, I've got a script out there that people are always asking, how do I run this in an automation? And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna send people to, to this article to understand how to move it over. Uh, but so yeah, shout out to Kavan for this good tutorial on on what, what you have to do to, and what the differences are between the two environments and how to move from, from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Very useful if you're scripting. <laughs> uh, yeah, this was a good uh, conversation on interfaces. Um, so just kind of a question from, from, a, from a consultant, um, Rupert asking about, you know, working with interfaces or some good conversation here um, about kind of the pros and cons, like everybody's asking for it, but there, I think like what you were saying, like there's all these like little things where you're like, ah, it's frustrating. Um, so there, so if you find yourself similarly, like struggling with interfaces, this is a good thread. Um, yeah. I think there's some good commentary in here. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, overall, I think the general consensus is, is, um, is, uh, there's a lot there, but just kind of like that last 10, 20% that just still is frustrating with them. Yeah, 
I saw there was a sentence I just saw up on, I think maybe it was Bill's post that said they tolerate weak features, which <laughs> I have to agree with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good, 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 good back and forth, Kavan. If you ever see a conversation between Bill and Kavan, that's worth <laughs> reading. It's, it's, I enjoy their back and forth. I think they, they like to uh, poke at each other a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yep. So, yeah, good conversation on on interfaces and and how maybe you can help them or use them more effectively. All right, the last segment, there, I've got four just kind of shout outs. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're going to do a deep dive um, later this season into ChatGPT. But it just this last month, it just started, it's, it's starting to show up everywhere. Um, so Greg built a really cool um, Chrome extension. And uh, I think it's now, it's now in the Chrome uh, store. And I believe it's free. Um, so it's kind of cool. It, so it's an extension, so it can actually like insert stuff into the browser. So it actually puts a, a button in the formula builder and it allows you to get help with your formula. Um, so you can ask inside the formula box and then it'll give you a, a sample um, a formula using ChatGPT and there's a video about it. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's another, there's an extension in the marketplace now um, that, uh, that basically you can take, um, you know, a prompt. So you have a field here and um, you can put your prompt there and then click the button and then it puts the output in the, in the uh, text there. Wow. So that's kind of cool. Um, it is called... Oh, this one is actually a script. I thought that, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, this one's a script. There's also in the marketplace, there's a dedicated extension that I think does very similar to this. Wow. So you could do it either way. So I don't know if it's from the same developer. Um, we'll have to find that out. But this one's actually a script and he provides the script there. So you just copy that and then you do have to provide your own um, API key from, from open, uh, AI. And so then you can, uh, get going, but it looks like it uses the, the configuration. So, um, it'll, you, you just have to copy this in and then it'll ask you for, it'll ask you for your key. Okay. So that's cool. Um, then now this one was also cool. This is, a uh, um, from John Keen. He has a YouTube video, basically how you um, can build ChatGPT Assistant in Airtable. So kind of similar to to that script, but takes it up a notch. I think he uses Make to to make the API call. Um, uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I started to watch the video, but I think it uses. I think the API call. Maybe it's directly. Maybe it is using a, a script to to make the call, but a very detailed tutorial if you want to incorporate chat GPT into um, your Airtable and create a co-pilot in there. And this was actually the same one that, that hint GPT. So um, yeah, nothing new there. So yeah, there's also, um, if you check, I'll, I do need to give a shout out to Bill French. He's been writing a lot about AI and, and uh, chat GPT and, and how he's got it set up and in, in a pretty advanced stuff. So if you go to, um, I, I believe in, in uh, table forums, he's got, yeah, there we go. Um, there's this one, I think there's others as well. So, so if you want to learn more about AI, um, you can check out Bill French's stuff. And uh, he's, he's talking a lot about it. These are others, so. I don't know. I'm still in the playing with the mode. I haven't like fully integrated it into my workflow. Other other people on our team on the consulting side um, are using it much more consistently as part of our our workflows. So uh, I need to I need to make it more a daily routine. I don't know how much you're using it. You still in play mode or is it? <clears throat> still in play mode. I've 
I don't really use it much for like my day-to-day -day work using Airtable, but I saw somebody the other day had, had a good use case for it where they actually fed it a formula and asked it to describe it. And then we're able to use that as their field description, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, you got to be really careful because ChatGPT does just make stuff up when it yeah. doesn't, when it feels like it. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is tricky. Um, yeah. So yeah, you got to be careful with it. <clears throat> So, all right, I think that's um, a, round the, a wrap up of Round the Bases and what's going on there. If we missed anything, uh, it's very likely we missed a major feature release. It all kind of blends together. So feel free to hit us up, let us know, um, and uh, we'll keep you up to date going forward. It's easier when we're on a weekly basis. There's, there's, there's uh, easier to keep our eyes on it. Okay, Spout, shout out to OnToAir, our primary sponsor. It's an all-in-one toolkit to run your business on Airtable. If your business depends on Airtable, then you definitely need to check out OnToAir and the suite of apps that we have. Um, I'm going to give a, a quick update on our forms. Um, we're getting close to, we're still in a private beta, although we have many people using it in production. Um, and getting really good success. Um, for today, I wanted to highlight, and Scott, I know is watching, this is, this is uh, thanks to Scott. We just made a change, and I don't even know if Scott knows this. I, I, I forgot to update him that, that this change went live. Um, but we now, uh, I wanna get feedback. So this is kind of a feedback session on how people would expect a form solution to work. Um, so with, when dealing with linked records, one of the challenges that we faced and we just changed the behavior over the weekend is how to deal with creating new linked records, updating existing records, and when that link takes place. Mm -hmm. So the behavior of how OntoAir um, works is you can, you can use the same, um, you can use the same form to either create a new record or edit an existing record. And uh, this makes it easy to, um, that's not good. <laughs> um, all right, found a bug. It's always good. <clears throat> um, and so, so we changed the behavior of, it used to be when you create, if you're, if you're creating a linked record, so like a sub, a child record, you would create that record and it actually would save in Airtable, but it wouldn't be linked to the parent until you saved the parent. Right. So that linking didn't happen until until you save the 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 top level form um, mm -hmm. here. And um, so based on feedback, especially from Scott, um, <laughs> heard him loud and clear. Um, we changed that and other people also expressed this. So now, when you create a new record, a new child record, it will automatically link to the parent record if the if you're editing an existing record. Um, if you're creating a new record, then there's nothing to link to until that that parent record is created. And so it's kind of confusing. We're, we're working on a documentation to, to explain this better, but uh, I want to get people's feedback because there's other scenarios where, so if you're because the difference between a form solution like ours and creating a new record in Airtable is, you know, in Airtable, you always create that parent first. So that parent always exists. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're outside of Airtable, that parent doesn't exist until you hit save. Um, and so the behavior is a little bit different than, than how it works inside of Airtable. We want to get this right. Uh, we're deciding if we make it configurable or just kind of set in stone what the behavior is and, and educate the clients because um, there's other differences if you're if you're um, removing so example you have a list of child records and you want to remove one of them that doesn't get unlinked until you hit save on the parent um, so there's different scenarios of when when the linking happens or gets removed um, or when it doesn't happen, depending on, you know, what state you're in. And so I want to get people's feedback. What would your expectations be with, with when that link takes place? 
Um, so as of now, it will, when you create a new child record, if the parent record exists, so if you're editing an existing parent record, that link will happen once you create the record. Um, Cause the other thing is we, we debated early on is when do you actually create the child record? Do you wait till you save the parent record? We decided that that, that actually gets created once you hit save on the child. So it's kind of confusing because you will have updated data in their table of the child record, but the parent doesn't get updated until you hit save on the parent. Um, so we're getting feedback from Scott. Mm. Save changes automatically affect the parent, says that's unlinking child or creating or editing. All right. Good feedback, Scott. We'll take it into consideration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let me know. I don't know. Any thoughts? That's it's a great philosophical question, right? Yeah. <laughs> My guess is everybody's gonna have different opinions. <laughs> no doubt. I will say that like I guess. It would be really nice if like in I guess in my opinion, it would be nice if like nothing happened until you hit save on the parent. But I could imagine that that would be a logistical nightmare for you to code on the back end. Um, but the, the thing that like I've found confusing when using form solutions like this, when you create the child and your child record has a formula, for example, for the primary key that's trying to read that parent name then when you create it, it's just got like a blank and then a dash and then whatever. So it just looks a little funny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of little details to keep in mind there. Yeah. 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 The, all those things. Yeah. Especially, or like your formula doesn't update until, you know, cause it has to go back to Airtable. So we solve that by creating our own formula field. And um, this was actually something else that just went live this weekend. Now a child table or a child record can actually reference a record from the parent. And so now you can create custom formulas uh, within the client, uh, within the form that reference the parent. So, and it will update live. And so that is a cool feature that, that's been requested quite a bit. It was um, challenging to pull off, but we got that working now. I hear you. So that, yeah, there's there's lots of little things. It's like, uh, okay, I could see it working different ways for different use cases. And that's one of the challenges with Airtable being just a flexible platform as it is. They, you know, everybody has a different opinion on how it should be implemented. Absolutely. <laughs> so that we, we have that similar struggle on our end. <clears throat> All right, there's our shout out to Onto Air. Check it out at ontoair.com. Okay, Ali's going to walk us through and how to use formulas with your single select fields. There you go. All right. Excellent. So I just threw together a small little use case for this demo, but there are a million ways that you could use this um, to your advantage. So here I've got in a variation of the sales CRM template that Airtable has. Um, I've got this close date field, and then I've calculated how many weeks that each of these opportunities has been aging. So this one's five weeks old, nine weeks old, 24 weeks old, and so on and so forth. Then I've calculated here in a formula with a bunch of nested ifs what I want um, my like aging status to be. So. This could really be anything you want. I'm sure that everybody's got their own little twist on this and in a bunch of different bases. Um, like sometimes you have a formula driven status that displays certain values based on certain parameters that that record holds. So in this case, we've just got, you know, if it's new, if it's less than five weeks old, I've designated that as a new opportunity. Um, 15, less than 15 weeks old, it's getting old less than 25 weeks old, getting older, then turns into danger. And then if it's over 35 weeks old, it just says too old. So that could be tweaked or changed in any number of ways. Um, now I'm going to show an example of a chart based on that aging status field. And so, and then this is one of the use cases as to why I like to 
take that formula field and turn it into a single select in a way, because these colors don't really mean anything to me, right? Airtable's um, default color scheme isn't super helpful in designating like, I would like the red to be when it's too old, but instead it's assigned that blue randomly. Um, all sorts of different reasons why I'd want this to be, I'd, I want more control over the color in this chart. Um, and if I go and pick any one of these, they're just, none of them are gonna line up exactly with where I would want them to be. So the way that I like to get around that is I create a single select field and I'm just gonna call it aging status. I like to put a little gear um, in front of my, a lot of different like formulas in Airtable. If like, I know that this formula field can stay hidden and it's also integral, integral to a process because this gear likes to, it's kind of a scary thing for people to look at and be like, oh, there's a gear there. That looks like it's important. I'm not gonna touch that. So uh, it's a nice little way to get around that. So I'm just gonna copy and paste into this field. Now I can take these and, you know, assign my colors to them as I want. Um, do, do, do. I could say new, I want new to be at the top. And then I also, if the opportunity has been closed, then it says closed one or closed lost. So now these colors are really what I want displayed on my chart. But this is not going to be updated automatically when this changes, right? Like if I move this so that it was new, this is now new, but this is still says getting old. So to get around that, I'm going to create one formula field here. And I put a little lightning bolt when I know that this uh, field is going to be triggering an automation. So I'll say update aging status. And I'm going to write a formula, very simple. It's just going to say if I have an aging status and that aging status does not equal my aging status single select, then I want to update the aging status. And this should be the only one that has this value in it. If I go here, only one is filled. So now I can set up an automation to update that aging status field. And I'm gonna go with when record matches conditions. You could, I suppose, ignore that, not do the formula and just use when record updated but I don't trust that trigger <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, I 99.9% .9 of the time I'm going with when record matches conditions and I try to have a formula that's gonna drive that. So I know I have more control over when that automation actually is triggering. Um, so basically this is just saying when update aging status is not empty. I only have this one that meets those conditions right now. And then I'm gonna update on the opportunities table, that same record that triggered the automation. And I'm gonna update my aging status single select with the value from the formula. So if I just run that real quick, you can see it crossed out getting old and it replaced it with new. And then also that update aging status formula field went away, returned empty. So now in my chart, if I flip how this is grouped, instead of my formula field, I can use my single select and it's much prettier with the colors exactly how I want them. I could then go change those colors if I wanted, like let's say I want too old to be black or gray that also updates my chart colors as well. So I've found that, that I just like doing that to get more control over how my interfaces look. 
Um, you can also use this, like if you wanted to make a, like a Kanban or Kanban, not sure how everyone pronounces that word. Um, if you wanted to make a Kanban view over this formula field, you obviously can only do it with a single select. So this would allow you to use this as your single select field instead. Yeah. Um, one last thing I will point out is I like to, whenever I do this, I usually set the field permissions to say that nobody except automations can update this field um, because otherwise, I'll show you what happens. I, I turned that automation on, right? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, if somebody comes here and flips this, it's just gonna change back. Mm -hmm. And that's a confusing user exper experience. Yeah. So I like to make sure that nobody can update that record. So that way it's just stays that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <clears throat> yeah, that's another, even the way that you set up that, that automation or that formula there to detect it, if you set it up the other way, where it's just listening like on the close date for when the close date was updated, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't have triggered if the if you manually changed the drop down to, to reset it back. So that's mm -hmm. another benefit of setting it up the way you did. But yeah, putting that permission on there, that that's nice. Definitely. Yeah, I've found that that's it's helpful because it just locks it down even further. Yeah. How does it, how does it behave in Kanban if you have that permission on there? Can you still do a Kanban, but you just can't drag it between? Yeah, I believe so. Let me here. Let me just present one more time and, yeah. and flow it. Do, do, do. Um, so now if I use Kanban. Do you have the permission on? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. So yeah, now I just can't yeah. drag them. So nice. yeah, but you still get the look and feel that yeah. the Kanban wants. That's kind of cool just to lock it in. Mm -hmm. Nice, very cool. That is a great trick. Yeah, get the coloring and get it the way you want. Mm -hmm. Nicely done. All right, let's move on. So this one, I wasn't quite sure. We don't have a segment. Um, actually, before I do that, quick shout out from Alex. Very cool. I've been using formula to update the dropdown field, but I was using the when record change automation. I've seen it not work only a handful of a couple of times. Yeah, it. I've. I feel like it runs when I don't expect it to, and it doesn't when I do expect it to sometimes, which I'm not a fan of. Yeah, yeah. All right, so understanding API tokens and keys. So a month, maybe two months ago, Airtable came out with some new ways to, to deal with third-party integrations. The old way that has been there for since the get-go is every account had one single API key and or every user, I should say. Every user had one single API key and it had read and write access and that was the only way you could integrate. And so there was no granular permissions around who could access what. You pretty much gave access to everything with that one API key. So they finally came out with more granular ways. Um, and I'm gonna walk through just kind of the, some of the differences. Um, so this API key, this is the old way. This used to be, actually, there's still, if you go to your account, there was a section here that showed this. If you click on it, it'll show the actual key. Um, and they have now a big, big uh, notice here that this will be ending at the end of January 2024. So if you've integrated anything with Airtable, you've likely come to this, copied your API key, inserted it into the third party tool. That you need to, um, once the tool has been upgraded and supports different methods, you'll need to upgrade that by the end of uh, basically this year. Um, my understanding, I know I think Scott mentioned that Make requires you to create new connections using the, the new approaches. And so you have to basically go through every automation that you have set up. <laughs> um and update them i don't know if you've gone through that process not yet, not yet. 
Zapier doesn't even let you use the tokens yet. Oh, uh, really? Or OAuth? They haven't implemented OAuth? Not that I've seen. It only accepts an API key currently. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so some haven't yet implemented it yet. So it's kind of confusing because you've probably gotten emails from Airtable saying you need to upgrade and you go and, and you can't because the third party tool has doesn't support the new methods yet. So it's all very confusing. Um, but basically, so now moving away from the old API keys, we have you know a year, less than a year now to, to migrate. There are three new approaches Two of them um, are the ones they talk about. There's a third one that, that I'll talk about, but it, it's only for enterprise accounts. Um, so the new approaches are personal access tokens and OAuth. Um, so let's start with OAuth. So OAuth requires the third party tool to implement it. So if they haven't implemented OAuth, then it means nothing to you yet. Um, so at Ontair, we just a couple of weeks ago, we released our OAuth integration. So now we're fully um, supporting the new approaches and we did it the smart way. We made it, you don't have to go through and reconfigure everything. You just go to your connection and there's now a way to upgrade that connection to use OAuth. And then anything that was already using that connection now uses the, the OAuth. So it's just one place that you need to update. And then if you have lots of, backups or forms configured. You don't have to go to each one to, to update them. So uh, hopefully that uh, is helpful. But so OAuth, the third party, basically sets up a, a gateway. You've likely seen this with Google or Twitter or anything. They, it comes up with a pop-up that says, do you want to, do you give permission to this third party tool um, to, to get access to it? And you give them permission. Now the OAuth with, um, let me see if I can, yeah, the OAuth with, um, with Airtable is even a little bit more granular because it actually asks you which um, base you want to give access to or which workspace. Um, and so you can actually just give access to certain bases or you can also give access to all workspaces and all bases. Um, so, so it can be as granular or as open as you want. Um, you can also define if you want to just give read access or write access or access to the meta information. Um, so that, that actually, I take that back. The developer determines what you, what they need, um, access to, and then you, you grant them access to that. So you don't decide what tiers you do decide what bases you give access to, but but not the read or write or whatever, the developer that implements OAuth determines that. And you have to then agree to that or not um, if you want to add access to that third-party tool. So that's OAuth, um, that's done more by the developer and then they present it to you. The one that's more in your control are these personal access tokens. And so what these allow you to do is, um, so if I go here and create a new one, and I'm actually going to use this for the next segment. Um, and so we are going to create a task Robin. So a personal access token, if you're, um, they only want you to use these for internal workflows. Um, if you're writing scripts and want to use access to your own API um, or to your own bases, um, that's where personal access tokens come in. They don't want third-party tools to rely on these. They want those to use OAuth. The main difference is, is these tokens um, don't have a refresh mechanism to them, meaning they don't require the developer to constantly be checking to see if, if the user still wants to give access. The user can come in here and, and revoke um, these tokens and delete them, which means they will no longer work. But um, in OAuth, there's another layer of kind of security to just make sure that that it's always up to up to date um, within a time frame, which is also a pain in the neck to deal with as a developer, but there is benefits to it. Um, so anyways, you create an access token, you define the scope. So the different scopes are what you're giving permission to. So they can see all the data, edit the data, 
deal, uh, interact with the comments. And then the base schema means they can read like all your table field names and field types and field configuration. And then writing means they can actually like create new fields or new tables um, using this access. And then there's also um, web hooks to, to interact with um, the web hooks that are now available. And then this one's more for developers of implementing um, um, extensions, which at one point used to be called blocks, then they were apps, now they're extensions, but it looks like the API is still using the original name of blocks. So you define that. So for this one, you got to give, I'm going to give read and write access. I think I need to give schema read and write as well. Um, and that's it. And then, and then now you can define the base. Um, I'm going to just give access to one base to make it simple. And then I'm going to create a token. I'm going to hide this so I don't <laughs> share my token. Okay, I copied it and then I'm done. Bring it back. All right, and so now I created this new token. It will actually, it popped up. I pulled it over to another screen. Um, and actually it looks like it shows partial, but this is not the full one. So if you try this, this won't work. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so now I have a token copied and, um, and so I can use it. So those are those are the two that you would interact with um, if you're you know if you're if you are integrated with a with another tool and they don't yet have OAuth then I would say don't use an access token some an access token wouldn't work some it might work it depends on how they they implemented the the tokens originally. Um, but uh, but they're going to have to implement OAuth by the end of the year. Like Zapier, I probably, you know, if you if you update it with access tokens, you're going to have to update it again once they implement OAuth. So that's fine if you want to do it twice or if you want to wait till they have OAuth implemented, you could do that. There is one other type of token that's only for enterprise level, and it's called a service token. And it kind of works very similar to these personal access tokens. The difference is um, a personal access token by its name is tied to a person. So this is tied to the user that created the token. So anything that this token does to like update a record, it will, if you look at like the last modified by, it'll be tied to the user that created that token. Mm -hmm. A service token that's only available at enterprise does not is not associated with any user and so it can kind of be this you know universal token that is updating it similar to when like automations update um records it shows that it was created by an automation mm -hmm. it will show i believe that it was created by a service um key or a service token and um, and maybe give the name of it. I can't remember. I, I've, I've used it once with an enterprise client. Um, I don't know if you know that how it shows up. I haven't played with it yet, so I'm not sure. But. Yeah, I think it, I think you name it just like you name these Turco tokens, and it'll say it was it was updated by that that service token. So so it's not tied to any individual user, which which is beneficial. And if you're at a company where people are coming and going, you don't want, you know, when you have to remove that person, if you have automations using that token, their personal token, they'll break once they get removed. And so a service token lives, uh, you know, forever beyond any individual user. So, yeah. so there's, there's definitely benefits to, to using service tokens. If you're at the enterprise level, that's a big benefit to it. Okay. So that is uh, understanding the API keys and we'll move on here. Um, got just a few minutes and just a quick shout out to join the Built On Air community. Our goal is to get to a thousand um, YouTube subscribers by the end of the year. Um, we're in the 700 range. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, join our community. If you're not already in there, builtonair.com slash join. This year, I think we do have some some big big plans coming for for Built On Air, so we'll be announcing some some updates in the future. 
Finally, an app a day, um, TaskRobin. So no association with TaskRobin. Um, use at your own risk. I, I have only seen this posted. Um, the the developer is posted in the in the um, forums, but I have not spoken or talked to this developer. So um, use at your own risk. But I wanted it is a cool functionality, so I thought it was worth um, showcasing how it works. And um, so basically, you go to the marketplace. By the way. When I went to uh, install this, I noticed there are a lot of new um, extensions in the last, you know, six weeks. Yeah. Um, so Airtable is getting more active at approving extensions. Um, so that's good to see. Uh, hopefully that continues and they they um, implement extensions. Airtable, you need extensions inside of interfaces, please. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That will be that that will be when extensions really become popular. I want pivot tables. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so what Task Robin does is it sets up an email address um, that on Task Robin, so it does integrate, so it does go through them. They kind of act as a as a proxy, but basically you can send any email. Um, to the address that, that you configure here at taskrobin.io and it will actually like save that email into your um, table that gets created here. And so I haven't actually walked through all of this, so we're going to do this live. This will be an unboxing. Um, so I'm going to use, I'll use my Dan at openside.com. Um, and then let's use a uh, built-on air. So I'm gonna so it's going to create a built-on air at taskrobin.io. And let me move this. I'm gonna enter the API key that I just created. So bad news. <laughs> take the token. They don't support the access token. So I, I I pasted in my API key, my access token, and it tells me it's in the wrong format. Mm -hmm. So they still use the old um, API key format. Yeah. So let me um, let me grab that real quick. Actually, uh, I'm logged in with a user that I'm not comfortable giving. So we're just gonna walk through it, um, how it works. But basically, um, let me bring it back in. So basically, how this works is you set it all up, and then you can send anything. You could set up email rules in your. Um, uh, oops. Yeah, we can't see your screen. Yeah, yeah, I gotta add it back into my tab. There we go. Perfect. Um, so once you set it up, as long as you're emailing it from here, you could set up like auto forward rules and then just forward it into this email address, then this application will automatically um, save it. So this is really cool for automating, you know, just any kind of email uh, ingestion into Airtable. Um, you can do this with Zapier and Make as well. They, they have that functionality. Um, maybe even more advanced where like I know Zapier has a email parser that can parse it out and then you could put specific fields um, based off of your email. Um, I use this on the consulting side for, for leads. I think you probably do as well. Um, and I part, I extract out, I do it through a script. So I actually have like regex and extract out from from the body of the email and then update fields um, and you could do that with this as well the benefit like this this is actually kind of good because it gets the email into Airtable and then once it's in Airtable then you can write a script to extract from there um, which is actually what I do as well but um, I use Zapier for for getting it into Airtable right okay. So, but it's cool, nice, nice app, this functionality, this would be, there is, I, I thought Airtable announced a feature. Um, it was like air, uh, email uh, syncing. Yeah. And I was hoping it was this functionality and maybe someday they will. It's not quite this, it's more of sending in like a CSV attachment yeah. that then gets synced. Um, this is what I was hoping for, but uh yeah, so this this is a cool cool app. Um, check it out, taskrobin.io.
And I believe they support other platforms as well besides Airtable. And is this free? Uh, I think they have a free tier for just a few um, emails and then it's it's paid for any kind of serious usage. Of course. Yep, yep. Okay. So, but yeah, check out um, check out the the extensions, and um, maybe we'll explore some of these others. If there's one you want us to explore, always open to um, digging into these. So mm -hmm. that concludes today's show. Thank you all. Excited to be with you for another season. We'll be back. We have a guest joining us next week, so be sure to catch us next time. We'll see you then. Yay! Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com, and we will see you next time on the Built on Air podcast. <laughs>